gentlemen, uh, one thing we didn't touch base on is when we ask the questions, we're going to give each of you uh, a chance to be first and be last. And so, uh, Chip, you just happen to be right here looking at me. Uh, so you're going to be the lucky one for uh, question one, and we'll go down the line. And then the next time, Mr. Brian, we'll start with you. So uh, if you all get a chance of being in the lines then and waiting your turn. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so here we go. Can you briefly describe your relevant experience and qualifications for the role of county commissioner? What motivated you to run for this position and what unique qualities do you bring to the table? Perfect. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for everyone being here and everyone online. So I'm in my second term as county commissioner, eight-year county commissioner. I'm also president of all county commissioners in Pennsylvania and president of the um, County Commissioners Association, which was elected bipartisan across the Commonwealth of all county commissioners. That's one big qualification I have that I'm not believed in just by Venango County, but every county in the Commonwealth to lead them as well. So over these eight years, we've done a balanced budget every year. We've had no tax increases. We've invested in local government. We've invested in infrastructure. We invested in our employees as well. So what we've done is work collaboratively with our region and also with other communities internal to try growing Venango County. So <clears throat> it's a process. In this term, we've had two years displaced with COVID where we couldn't get a lot done, but we focused directly on individual municipalities, nonprofits, businesses, where we've given over $2 million during COVID to our businesses to help them survive. So through all that, over the past eight years, we've done a lot, and there's a continued effort to continue that on. So also a couple of other qualifications. Through that, I've also been uh, selected as special advisor of the Carnegie Mellon's robotics program, which I'm chair also of the Institute of Innovation for eight years, worked very, very hard to put Venango County back on the map, get us out in front in conversations that we've never been part of before. But the whole goal that I've worked on is giving Venango County opportunities that we don't often see. And that is a lot of collaboration with other counties, working together, figuring out how to create a wheel and recreate a wheel that's been done to benefit our residents and hold the line on taxes and give us the most services we can. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> I'm this guy. <laughs> Ken Bryan. Uh, I want to start off by saying thanks because I'm proud to be up here. You know, the process of just getting at this table, sitting at this stage, has been a, you know, a tough process. And I wouldn't have been able to do it without my wife sitting up there who supported me through this uh, entire process and I think she probably would have thrown me out by now if I was home at all of be thrown out uh, I want to thank everyone that supported me in the primary and I've gotten so many so much support from so many people throughout the process so that's number one uh, my background <clears throat> I think it's pretty diverse I think it's uh, a little unique uh, just because I've I'm kind of pretty much all over the map I started off went to Catholic grade school in high school my parents have sacrificed everything for me to get through that process. And then from there, I went into the military. Uh, I was fortunate enough to serve under Ronald Reagan and uh, spent all my time in Central America. That was a great learning experience for me because I get to see firsthand how things go in third world countries. And I got to see corrupt politicians and a lot of things that just made it very difficult for people to live on a day-to-day -day basis. So it was uh, a great learning experience for me. I went from the military after a few years, of, I was in school, I ended up getting a job in the entertainment business. And I started off with a small company called Vidmark Entertainment. They were acquired by a company called Trimark Pictures. And then from Trimark Pictures, I was fortunate enough uh, to retain my position there and go on to Lionsgate Films. Uh, one, once involved in Lionsgate Films, um, I think just again through good mentors and surrounding myself with smart people. Um, I continually got promoted. I left Lionsgate Films in, I think it was 2018, and I left there as a senior vice president. I oversaw the entire United States, Puerto Rico, and parts of Canada. So I was blessed to see the world, or see the country. Is that it already? Two minutes? Okay, my time. Thank you. We'll give you the fighters 10 seconds. All right, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. As Ken said, it's an honor to be up on stage. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about myself tonight. Uh, my name is Matt Beath. Uh, I live in Franklin with the love of my life, Michelle, and our three incredible kids, Ellie, Augie, and Harper. I have a degree in English literature, although I've studied everything from molecular biology and biochemistry to Eastern religion and sociology. 
I've lived and worked all over New England, including spending five years on a meat production sheep farm in upstate New York. I'm a realtor and a certified general appraiser with Beef Associates, and I have extensive public service experience. I chair four different local and regional boards. I'm a director or member of another six boards. I'm the high commissioner of the Pennsylvania Stone Skipping Championship, <laughs> and I MC Franklin's parades and other outdoor public events. I'm, that's my favorite one, too, Sam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What I've learned through these opportunities is that Venango County does a lot of things really well. And I also see the challenges our residents and businesses face every day. The cost of housing, employment challenges, health care concerns. These are a few places where I see room for improvement. That's why I'm running for Venango County Commissioner. My diverse work and life experiences put me in a unique position to bring a new, positive attitude and new strategies to these concerns. I have a plan to create long-term social and economic prosperity built on the pillars of housing, mental health and human services, and education. Because when we provide adequate affordable housing, informed health care, and education opportunities, we create a pathway to success for all residents of Venango County. And when we do that, we improve life outcomes, which improves the economy. That's how we can make Venango County a better place, together. I believe the foundation of every good leader is not politics, it's public service, and I'm ready to serve as that kind of leader in the commissioner's office. Thank you. Oh, timing, timing. Um, Likewise, thank you. I want to thank everybody for being here and especially thank the Venango uh, uh, Area Chamber of Commerce and Susan and all of her staff for putting this on. Events like this are so important because otherwise our campaign really comes down to a bunch of signs that you see with our names on it driving through the county. And, uh, the, and elections have consequences. And the people who, who you elect to do those jobs really do matter. So having an opportunity to actually tell you where we stand and answer some questions so that you understand who you're voting for and what they believe in, so valuable and we don't do it enough. But uh, why am I running, or my background? Uh, I worked, uh, grew up in Oil City, where I still live. For about a decade, I worked for Congressman Mike Kelly, where I worked for the interests of Western Pennsylvania, literally, literally the reason that I took the job. Uh, but I always knew I was going to come back here. And I would never have run if I didn't think that I had the qualifications and, frankly, was the best person for the job. And uh, so I still feel that way. That's why I'm throwing my hat in for the ring again. My qualifications, I think the last four years, we've done a lot that show that uh, we've, we have that I've been a, a good commissioner. Uh, when we when I came into office, we were facing uh, a tax hike that people said that the current commissioners at that time, one of them at least, said had to happen in the next four years. I said that was not going to happen. At least I was not going to vote for that. We've been able to get through this four years now with um, with uh, with out raising taxes, but also while having historic surpluses in our with our county budget. And also, in the meanwhile, being able to give uh, pay, or wage increases that were, we were told when I was coming in would be impossible to do and were incredibly needed for our employees at the county. Uh, on, top, uh, on top of that, we've also been able to make many investments in a lot of different community projects, which I can't wait to tell you about in the coming minutes. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> well done, sir. You weren't loud enough. comes to priorities, obviously, just like in life, you set priorities, but they continually change, right? <clears throat> so at the moment, and the process I've been going through is running for county commissioner. These are the things I want to focus on. And one, the first one is one I campaigned on, are uh, doing the best I can to or get to the county to focus as much as we can on the drug issues in Venango County. Obviously, it's a national issue. 
but I, I do think with my background, we'll be able to have, may have a significant impact when it comes to drugs uh, in our in our county. What's related to that also is crime and then school safety. All three of those things to me correlate. Um, the second thing I want to focus on is the bank building in Oil City. So I think as everyone's aware, the county has a lot of monies invested in that property, and there's been some blowback uh, with the decisions that were made there. Um, but after reviewing it, looking back at the budget, look, talking with people, and uh, surrounding myself with some smart people, my job now will be to put butts in the seats there, to make sure that that thing gets fall, follow through on, it gets completed, um, that we're actively overseeing the project, and that we're going to get uh, that you know, building occupied. The 911 system, too, is another big spend. I want to make sure that it's implemented properly, that everyone's trained, and, you know, it follows through and it's a success for the area. And then last but not least, I know it's been kind of put on the back burner, but Polk Center. You know, it's a beautiful facility down there. The state it just seems to be uh, fighting with us over control of Polk Center. I want to do everything in my power to try to bring that back, make it prosperous, and, again, get that occupied. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share my priorities for my first term in office. Between Michelle's work at a local philanthropy, my work as a realtor, and all the volunteer and public service work she and I do across the region, we get a significant amount of exposure to the issues in Venango County, and we spend a lot of time at our house <laughs> talking about these issues. It's important to us that all residents have the ability to find the success and happiness that we've found here. Through both of our individual work and volunteer experiences, we've recognized that there are some overarching needs in our communities. That's why I have a vision for long-term social and economic prosperity that's built on the pillars of housing, mental health and human services, and education. By working closely with existing economic development organizations, private companies, county human service departments, housing authorities, health care providers, and education institutions, I believe that Venango County residents and businesses can flourish in ever greater ways. With this effort, the county can become an attractive community for indiv individuals and companies looking to establish new commercial enterprise in northwestern Pennsylvania. Education, adequate affordable housing, and addiction and mental health services are the keys to unlocking our full potential. <clears throat> In conjunction with workforce development, these core services will help create more engaged and employable individuals, which is a benefit for existing local businesses and also for companies looking to relocate or expand their footprint. The increased tax revenue can be used to invest in continued development of countywide infrastructure to meet 21st century challenges. And these are the types of priorities that create long-term viability and community strength for all of Venango County. Thank you, guys. I appreciate the extra time. I think you got it. Thanks, Sam? All right. Trying to limit this to three priorities <laughs> is tough, especially for me. Uh, but I do want I but to give some focus, I always try to think of what are the key things that we have that are our responsibilities as a commissioner. And the number one of those is our budget, making sure that we're making fiscally responsible decisions so that we're allowed to do all the other things. It's just like when you're growing up and, you know, if you don't take care of the needs, you're not going to be able to take care of the wants. Um, the second thing is making it as easy as possible to do business in Venango County. That is something that I think has so many... Uh, effects on uh, the ripple effects of it throughout the county, um, you know, our school systems, everything else, rely on us being uh, a place that's good to do, good to do business here. But um, it's like with anything else, my vision for the county, I had a very wise per mentor in my life who one time said, Sam, focus on your strengths, but make sure you try to shore up your weaknesses. And I think uh, if we do that, we have a lot of strengths. And we do have some weaknesses, but if we, if we sure those up, then we'll be good. Two of the weaknesses that I'd say we need some shoring up on, rural broadband expansion. Absolutely, this is something that we've been working on. Uh, we've teamed up with Cranberry and with Aura, as, lo as well as others, to do an expansion program where we just got a grant for $1.5 million. Everyone involved has skin in the game to, uh, to do a, a very large expansion there. We're also applying for other, uh, other grants. Uh, the second thing, as Ken said, 
I think if there's one thing you could take out of the community right now to fix it and have fix a lot of things, it would be if we could just eliminate drugs. We know that that's not possible, so, but we do have some things we can do. We're taking the opioid settlement money that we're getting, and we're going to put that into starting a reentry program focused on drug offenders in our county prison. That's something I'd love to talk more about, but... <laughs> Just in time. <laughs> so, three things that keep me up at night that I think about an awful lot. The first thing is our county workforce, and especially our county employees. And how do we invest in them to get more production, more productivity, and boost morale? That's one of the things in the intermediate short term that I've been really focused on, and I know Sam has as well. But how do we better that? And that helps our services and that helps our providers to be a more robust entity. That's one of the things that I truly think about the most. The other two things I'll touch on pretty quickly is one's the jail. And we have a whole new two judges getting in, which I don't think they're here, came downstairs. But with the energy those two have coming into the, in the judgeship, that's an opportunity for us. And that when Sam hit on the reentry program, we have an 80 to 90 percent recidivism rate in our county prison. And if you look at our county compared to other counties across the Commonwealth, we have one of the highest incarceration rates. Now, positive or negative, you want to look at that in the community, but a lot of them are low level offenders. And how do we create programs that help keep them out of jail in recidivism? Because once they're in that spiral, we got to undo that spiral and get them out, get them empowered, get them in the workforce. That's the other thing I've been working on and really trying to do. And the third and last but not least, today we had a call with um, Secretary Seiger, Secretary DCED. And I always say we're bringing the rust belt to the smart belt. So I do a lot and I always look at our corridor from Pittsburgh to Erie and we're the heart of that. And we're the heart of the innovation for the future of America in this corridor. So even today, and Secretary Seiger was saying, how do we start to expand that? How do we start to grow that, which I've been saying for a few years now, but is really trying to bring new ideas. Um, the administration is currently creating this whole new workforce development plan, a whole new economic development thing to make Pennsylvania more, um, <clears throat> more competitive with other states around us. But emphasizing that and creating a culture from Erie to Pittsburgh that we're the heart of that in the middle to build on to make us vibrant again in western pennsylvania that's it thanks jim good job all right this one mr beats we'll start with you yeah. how do you envision the county's growth and development over the next decade and what role do you see yourself playing in that vision mm -hmm. sure that's a great question <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to talk, Dan and Matt, uh, about the importance of having a vision for long-term success, for the long-term success of Venango County. You know, I sit on numerous strategic planning committees and boards, including actually the Venango County Economic Development Authority Strategic Planning Committee. Uh, but um, I also sit on the Allegheny Valley Board of Realtors Strategic Planning Committee. Uh, and so I understand the importance of having a vision. Uh, that vision gives you a work plan for the next decade, which is integral to success. It's like having a road map, and it gives you confidence in decision-making in the present because you know where you're trying to get to in the future. You know, when I think long-term, though, about the next 10 years in Venango County, uh, honestly, the first thing that comes to my mind is my kids, uh, and especially, you know, my family as well. And um, what opportunities do I envision for them? You know, I had a really positive upbringing in Venango County, and I want the same for them, my kids. But I also want that upbringing for all residents of Venango County. And so I see in 10 years, if we follow the plans that I've set out and are cognizant of the priorities that I have and that fellow commissioners have and work together to achieve those priorities, you know, I see thriving communities where every resident has a safe, affordable place to live. I see adequate access to mental health services so that we can start to address the substance abuse and addiction problem that plagues our communities. I see robust education opportunities for all residents, whether you're seeking a college degree, a high school education, or vocational training. I see Venango County where everybody has the resources and tools they need to be happy, healthy, and successful. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, how I envision Venango County's growth. All right, 
economically, we have traditionally we had a lot of big industry here, and uh, we ha and and what always has been amazing to me is that at this point now we don't have as many of those giant companies, uh, but our unemployment rate still stays about the same as it would have been even back then, because we have so many small employers that are local that we that have connections to this community now. So when we're talking about economic growth, I think it's important to focus on the commercial end of it. And I'm still always going to be searching for those big fish to try and land. I'm a fisherman, and I want to catch a big fish. But when you're talking about it figuratively, bringing a bigger company in, we always want to do that. And we're going to focus on doing that. But I think the real area of growth that I my vision is for and I think is a good prediction is um, that the way that the direction has gone now in, with our economy nationally with um, remote working being a possibility it means that people are going to live where they want to live because they don't have to where they want to be and where they want to spend their time on a weekend um, that's an awesome opportunity for us here uh, for us to take advantage of that we do have to make sure that the things that they need, like rural broadband, are uh, available to them. Uh, make sure that our infrastructure is uh, like cellular infrastructure and all our technological infrastructure is up to par. Uh, and that's going to improve things all around. It improves our tax base, which improves our schools, and it becomes the old saying that a rising tide lifts all boats. So I think if we focus on that, that area, um, you know, my vision is a place that is that everyone else gets to enjoy exactly what I love so much about this community and why uh, I have called it my home and plan to for the rest of my life. So this works out well. I kind of ended on this. So I'll be honest with you. I really want a community college for our county. Uh, this summer I had talks with Penn West Clarion and Casey pretty in depth with two community colleges that come into our area. And we're sitting in this campus and we be bluntly see the future of what's going to happen here. But I truly believe in the trades and I believe in the two-year degrees and we are sitting in a perfect facility that has that opportunity. And it gives the opportunity to our residents to be a feeder program for UPMC, be a feeder program to our nursing staff and um, senior centers. It is an opportunity. I truly want a community college in the worst way and that's an opportunity. Sometimes our four-year universities, with as many as there are around us, Pennsylvania is number two in the nation for universities per capita. So we have that. But community colleges is that gap filler. And that gap filler is an opportunity for workforce here to get trained. Get trained locally, get trained real time on what our needs are in the county. Now they have to leave the county if they want a two-year degree. When they leave a county, they're staying in that county. They're getting sucked up by the industry around them. But creating those opportunities here as feeder programs for our current industry is huge. And then I bring up the Rust Belt to the Smart Belt. That's an entrepreneur innovative mindset that we have in our county. And it's helping facilitate and grow because if you look at all of our large businesses outside of a few, they're all homegrown businesses. And I'll say Rod Griffin. Rod Griffin's a homegrown businessman. And look what he's at. Who's the next Rod Griffin down the line that can do that? We have those opportunities to grow and expand. It's capitalizing on them, but we have to have the right tools. And I go back to a community college is one of those tools that we do not have in our tool belt. And the other side is you see the growth coming north and a little bit south from Erie. But that growth coming north with Butler being the fastest growing county in the nation, we can take advantage of that because we have a beautiful lifestyle up here. We're remote. You can get on the Internet and do whatever you want to do wherever you want to work and you can do that here but also transition that into office space industrial space and creating that workforce through many opportunities <clears throat> thank you i think everyone's saying the same thing um because all three points or all these points make sense to me again i have selfish reasons for how why i got involved in this to begin with and then uh, what I want to do or what with the impact I want to have for Venango County. I mean, it's simple for me. I have three children. They all live out of the area. I'd love to give my three kids back. I'd love to have my grandkids back. And you do that by looking for every opportunity. Talk, it's simple. You, you, you got to talk with small business. You got to talk with small, with large businesses. You got to look for every opportunity to help better the area, to, to, to find those little sparks out there, people that are that have ideas that, that you know, just need help getting those ideas up and running. And just I want to use my own example. My wife and I, uh, and again, with a lot of support from others, we started our little bar and convenience store out in Utica, Krabby Kelly's. 
Well, it started, you know, as an idea through a lot of hurdles. We, we made it work. Now we're bringing, you know, money back into, into the little town of Utica. It's bringing people in there, and they're having a great experience doing just that. Um, that's what we need. If we look for those little opportunities across the county, it's going to better everything. Secondly, the schools. You know, you're growing up, these people, these uh, young families, they want to have good schools. So I've already been working directly with the schools to make them safer. Chip, everyone here has touched on, you know, let's broaden our opportunities for education. Let's see if we can enhance what we have here. And, and you know, not just work, look at the tech side, but look at the bl uh, blue collar mm -hmm. side. Look at the uh, uh, trades. I mean, because, again, there's huge opportunities there. And then last but not least, which a lot of people in this room do, like Susan and others, they're focusing on entertainment and looking for fun things for people to do. If we offer those things, if we can build on that, we're going to have a great future in Venango County. Thank you. Well spoken. Thanks. This time we're going to start with Sam. Oh, I thought it was with Ken. Let's see. Let's see. <clears throat> we're going to be talking about fiscal responsibility. Mm. How do you plan to ensure responsible budgeting? fiscal management while maintaining or improving essential county services. What strategies would you use to address potential budget shortfalls for unexpected financial challenges? Well, first of all, if you do a good job setting a budget in advance, you that's how you deal with potential budget shortfalls. Um, we're lucky enough that we have right now a whole lot of directors of our departments and other elected row officers uh, in our county that are part of a team and we are on the same page and we so genuine generally everybody knows that it's their taxpayer money that's going into the things that they're doing and uh, they've been very responsible with their budget we also are blessed to have an incredibly uh, good uh, fiscal agent in uh, Deanna Brink, uh, Brick, who knows the budget inside and out, and knows everything that's coming in and everything that's going out. But basically, uh, and I, th I feel very blessed to be able to work with all of them, uh, it makes my job a lot easier. But the basic thing that you have to, uh, for us, when we were coming in, we had uh, not shortfalls, but we were told we had to raise taxes. Uh, I said we were not going to do that. And we have now, we have an operating reserve that's historically high for our county. Uh, we did that without raising taxes and increased wages. How do we do that? Basically, we maximize all of the um, uh, non real estate tax related fund, funds, our general uh, fu that go into our general fund. We maximize what we get from the state and federal government, frankly, and we constantly are in search of how we can uh, supplement our budget with uh, and our projects that we're doing with uh, grant money and other sources like that. We've gone into hyperdrive uh, because of the st staff that we have, uh, making sure that we're never leaving money on the table. It's my job to make sure that, uh, you know, fiscally, I want that federal and state budget to be a small pie, but it's my job as commissioner to make sure I get as big a piece of that small pie for Venango County as possible, and we've been doing that. Thanks, Sam. Chip, go ahead. So four years ago, sat up here potentially hitting a tax hike. So out of a $60 million a year budget, $11 million is local taxpayer dollars off your property taxes. Four years ago, we had two to $300,000 sitting in our reserve account. Mind you, today, through the work that the three of us have done, We've been able to make that around 12 to 15 million, just thrown out a ra random number. We've done that with looking at contracts that have never been looked at in the past, having opportunities to see things differently than we never did in the past. Um, one example I had, we just gave $12 million to a local investment firm to invest in CDs, mm -hmm. government T-bills actually, paying 5.5%. That's real money. Mm -hmm. That's $600,000 a year of real money offsetting our general fund. Two years of that is one mil of tax increase. Mm -hmm. That's something that hasn't been looked at. And that's where my financial background, of formerly being a financial advisor, comes into play. It's how do we get the most out of our dollars? So we've been able to give our employees 
um, benefits. We looked at that. We've looked at pay raises really extensively, and also it's long-term planning. And the three of us today, if we look at a decision and a budget transfer, a budget request, we also look at what's that, what's that going to affect us in three years. We haven't played the card that some counties have done where they've given huge pay increases to their employees because at the end of the day, that was one-time COVID funding they're using to pay their employees. Their potential tax base, which we're going to see in the next couple years, is going to be whipsawed. And the three of us currently do not want to whipsaw our tax base with a – double your taxes or a huge tax raise. So we look at things systematically, and we also look at things in a process based where we don't want to jump the gun and pull a trigger depending on what the future looks like because mm -hmm. we don't think our potential residents can handle a 30% tax increase on our end, especially with our aging population. So we take it very seriously and blessed hopefully over the next four years there won't be another tax increase, but we're doing big things and long-term planning to make sure that doesn't happen. Thanks, Chip. Now we'll go to Ken, fiscal responsibility. You know, it's funny, we were talking earlier about, because oh, again, they relate just about job growth. And obviously, if you really focus on job growth, that brings it more revenue, it increases that tax base. And that's a good, healthy way of going about it. But I've been involved in budgets all my life, working in the entertainment business for all those years. Every film that Lionsgate produced, there's a budget attached to it. I was a part of that process, so I had to make sure that my staff, my team, come in on budget. So I understand the challenges behind that, because everyone in this new room also knows that things go up. And lately, it seems like everything has gone up. The cost of everything has gone up. So that's always a, a big concern. So what it comes down to is it's spend on needs, not wants, like Sam talked about earlier. and. To get a little bit more specific, and I'll use another analogy, you don't need a Cadillac when a, a Chevrolet will do. So you have to be real cautious on how you spend and make sure you really are asking the hard questions. And it's a $60 million budget, like they said, but, you know, 20 comes from the federal, 20 comes from the state, and then the rest of the monies, you know, we have a little bit of control over on how that manages. But you, you can't get consumed in that overall number. you got to dot every I, cross every T. You have to look for different ways where you can save. I'm not a big guy when it comes to county ownership. I'm not a big fan of that because I'm a, more of a fan of, of private enterprise coming in and acquiring that type of stuff. But the county sure can play a strong role in supporting that process. 30 seconds. Um, and then last but not least, again, what's nice about this group, we're pretty diverse. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can skin a cat. Where can I take some monies from here? We're overspending here. Let's move it over there. I think a common sense approach, and again, consulting with others, we have some great experienced people in this county. We can make good choices and stay fiscally responsible. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. And mm -hmm. we'll wrap this question up with that. <laughs> great, thank you. Uh, obviously, fiscal responsibility and smart spending are important to everybody. Uh, and I think I speak for everyone, if they haven't said it themselves already, uh, nobody wants to raise taxes. Uh, you know, as a realtor, I see firsthand the impact that tax increases have on people's daily lives. Uh, you know, often one of the first questions buyers ask is, what are the taxes on this property? You know, it's a challenge, and we need leadership who understand how to be creative with local dollars to get the best bang for our buck. You know, I've talked about this before, and Sam mentioned this too as well, uh, but it's imperative that we capitalize on every opportunity to increase our revenue. And that means grant writing and applying for money from other f state and federal funding sources. Uh, I have experience working for an international grant writing company, and I've written grants, and I, I know how to be creative in finding new funding sources. But it's not just about finding money. We also have to be prudent with our spending. It's important to understand that a dollar spent today to make 100 in the future is wise spending. And one of the best ways that we can maximize our spending is by focusing on human resources. Yes, it's expensive to hire new employees, but it's more expensive to not hire because critical services suffer, which hurts the citizens of Venango County. And also because insufficient staffing puts a huge morale drain on our existing employees who become more likely to quit, which in turn means you have to hire and train somebody new and you spend the money twice. Yep. 
In this light, we could be more fiscally responsible by focusing on hiring for open positions with the intention of developing strategies for retention. That starts with good pay, good health insurance, and a positive work environment. Employees are the county's greatest asset, and they're the key to preserving and improving essential county services. By expanding our scope of revenue, we can capitalize on those opportunities. Thank you. Perfect. So one thing I'll tell you as president of the Commissioners Association, two, three weeks ago I was in Harrisburg. Uh, the state has not given a mental health base funding increase in the past 15 years. This year we got a small increase for the first time in 15 years, but there is $1.2 billion under funding of mental health in the state of Pennsylvania. That's a huge issue. So this isn't, it's a county issue, but it's a Commonwealth issue as well. So we have services, we're stretching pennies to make dollars in the mental health field. And if you look across the Commonwealth and Venango County, mental health needs are on an increase. Everyone talks about mental health, but it's finding creative ideas and working collaboratively with other counties that are doing the things good to make that happen. So it's hard to do it because it's a funding issue. We can't expand a ton of services without the funding from the state and the feds that we need to provide the adequate funding because right now at UPMC there's 12 ER beds and at any given time nine to ten of those ER beds are filled with behavioral health people so that's an issue it's a capacity issue where do we put the people how do they get the needs how do they get the help because it's hard to get someone 302 it's hard to get someone in the system that needs help that they truly do that's one side of it the other side of it is emergent preparedness so we're taking on a huge capital project seven million dollars seven point nine million dollars to upgrade our 911 system which has not been upgraded in decades Right now, we are putting Band-Aids on our issues, and that's real-time first response. When you pick up the phone and call 911, the gentleman sitting out there or the lady sitting out there at the fire are the ones that use that equipment. That is something we're really working on to help give them a more of a robust system. There potentially won't be as many dead spots. We're going to have 98% coverage. But it's giving our first responders and our volunteers tools and opportunities to be better prepared when they show up on the scene. So I think that kind of wraps that up. I'm going to start on the second half of that because Chip mentioned it, the 911 system. Uh, I agree with them wholeheartedly that that was a much needed spend, but the $7 million of our tax dollars, right? So you have to make sure you follow through on a spend of that level. So as county commissioner, that's going to be one of my tasks. I mentioned it, one of the things in the beginning, to make sure that that gets implemented properly and that everyone that's involved in that project, because it's an extensive project, is held the line and, you know, that, and that we're going to have assurances that it's going to work properly. We're going to make sure that the people that are, uh, that are actually using the handhelds are of our first responders, that they're trained properly, and then if we do have a maintenance issue, that we have proper coverage in order to get that maintained. That, again, is going to help us, you know, for the unexpected, for it could be you know, things that are coming via through Mother Nature or things we have to contend with it from Harrisburg or, or D.C. Um, I'm a prepper at heart, so this is, um, is something I'm passionate about. The second thing is a little more personal because I have family members that have suffered with drug and alcohol. I lost two brothers from drug and alcohol. I lost one of my, my lovely sister-in-law from drug and alcohol. I have a, a, different, a little different approach. I'm a tough love guy. I want the county to make sure that they do, can do all they can to help people in need. But I personally want something back in return. I want commitments from them. If people are out there and they need help, we, we need to be there for them. A mental illness, we need to be there for them. But I, I, want some, I want something back from them in return. I want to make sure that the programs are set up, that the, where they have to be accountable. So again, maybe that person is suffering with drug and alcohol, we're going to get them off and stay off, but it has to be a commitment on their end as well. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think this is one of the most important and pressing questions for our region. Um, you know, 
Ken, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to talk about as well is that, you know, I, I didn't think that I was alone to mm -hmm. say that I have loved ones who've struggled, struggled mm -hmm. with addiction and substance abuse and drug use. And it's devastating to see someone you love struggle with these issues, especially when they can't get adequate health care. The flip side of that coin is the jubilation you feel when someone you love is finally able to completely overcome addiction and substance abuse. Ensuring adequate access to health care resources is important enough to me that it's one of the three pillars of my campaign and one of the primary priorities for my first term. I believe that addiction and substance abuse are mental health issues and it needs to be treated as such. By being an outspoken champion for the importance of proactive mental health care, we can address many of the underlying causes of addiction. I will continue to support the county's existing mental health and human service departments, along with empowering community health care providers in an effort to eliminate the stigma associated with mental health care. Furthermore, we need to ensure that those in treatment and recovery have a defined pathway to success. We need to encourage regional employers to not discriminate on the basis of drug or other substance abuse and addiction convictions alone. The county should be setting the example by working with the judicial system to make sure that residents who suffer from addiction and substance abuse have the ability to reintegrate themselves into the community and the economy. In doing so, we can reduce the number of relapse, recidivism, and fatality cases throughout the county, which will save money, save lives, and save families. Thank you. Amen to that, brother. Uh, I'm going to repeat what I think has been set up here, but that goes with being the last person. So, uh, first, uh, two things. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we are doing it right now. Uh, one, our human services department does a phenomenal job, and they are not um, thanked. I don't. Th I don't think they they always feel thanked enough on the work they do in our communities uh, on substance abuse. Uh, there's not a single family, and I, I don't think that there's a person in Venango County that hasn't been touched by substance abuse um, in, in their lifetime here, whether it's them or their family members or someone they know, someone that went to school with. So one of the things that I really wanted to see happen, when we, when we, were, uh, when we were able to get uh, opioid settlement money, uh, we were talking about, we, we put together a committee um, of, uh, of people that actually do that, that kind of work to talk about what, how it would be best spent. And they came up with a couple priorities, and there was one major thing missing in our county, and that is in our jail, so many of the people that are in there are basically underlying its mental health and uh, um, and substance abuse issues that have them in there. And our recidivism rate, as we've said, is way too high. Um, so we didn't have a strong reentry program. In fact, it really wasn't there after uh, COVID. So we're using the money from opioid settlement and focusing it on hiring and having, um, having, uh, you know, uh, having uh, re redoing our reentry program to focus on those people that are drug offenders so that they can be productive members of society when they get out and not just get back in. Secondly, our 911 program for public safety uh, in Venango County, 911, they are partners with every one of the first responders in the county, uh, and we are directly responsible for them and their system. So the $6 million uh, radio upgrade that we're doing is going to affect everyone in this county. And there were, we had, just like with your cell phones, there's huge radio spot, blank radio spots that uh, we need to be filled. I should have started with that. <laughs> <laughs> detriment of going last. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this time we're going to start with Ken, mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about collaboration and bipartisanship. You guys are doing so great tonight. How do you plan to work collaboratively with other county officials and across party lines to achieve common goals? Can you provide examples of your ability to find <laughs> common ground and build consensus? Do I have to cooperate with <laughs> other parties? Come on. Uh, it's you know it's it's an easy question to answer. I mean, it's life. I mean, you have to do that regardless in any type of business you're in. Um, 
you have to be able to find the best in others and you know be able to open up communication keep that's why god gave us one mouth and two ears right you want to listen and learn from others and you can get good information and get good support from anybody regardless of a identify as an R or a D or an I or whatever. It doesn't matter. If you're a good person, you're a good person. If you're not, you're not. You don't base anything on race or any type of discrimination. I'm looking for anyone that can help me accomplish an objective. Um, and I've done it my entire career. Obviously, on the Lionsgate side, it's a very liberal environment in Hollywood. Um, and I have some wonderful friends, some very strong relationships there. I don't think I don't see anything changing. I'll be 60 years old in November. Um, I, I enjoy working and surrounding myself with good people, and that will continue. Thanks, Ken. Mm -hmm. On to Matt, we're talking about collaboration and bipartisanship. Yeah, absolutely. Great topic. Uh, collaboration and bipartisanship are imperative to a proper functioning government. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, I'm a realtor by trade, and although it's considered a sales field, I can assure you that sales actually has very little to do with it. Realtors are negotiators. We spend a majority of our time trying to figure out how to get two distinct individual parties, a buyer and a seller, to come together to satisfactory terms for a transfer of a property. Communication is key to that process. Bringing together two diametrically opposed parties to consummate a successful transaction relies on keeping people focused on the ultimate goal. Each party may have a unique set of motivations and desires. However, a seller's goal is to sell a property and a buyer's goal is to buy one, and it's my responsibility to ensure that both parties stay focused on that goal. There's a lot of specific examples that I could talk about. My favorite one actually is with Bill Moon. I don't see him out there anymore. There he is. Uh, Bill and I worked together on the sale of 106 Walnut Street, which is transferred from private ownership into county ownership. You know, a lot of times those transactions go south because there can be a tendency in buyer and sellers to think that the county has unlimited deep pockets. And so it's a challenge to get people to agree to negotiate. Fortunately, in that instance, Bill and I were able to communicate well, and we were able to convey the notion that the sale was more than just cash dollars in his pocket. And if you've been out to see this uh, hub, you understand the value to the community extends way beyond the sale price. Now, I'll bring that skill to the commissioner's office. There's going to be times when we don't agree. Each of us brings an individual set of priorities and prerogatives to the table, and sometimes they don't align. That doesn't change the common goal, though, which is the betterment of Venango County. If everyone's focused on the common goal, partisanship no longer matters. Thank you. Good job on the timing. Thanks. <laughs> Sam, you're up. The way we've done it, uh, the, the way we've been able to do it so far um, is when everyone understands that they're part of a team and they have a common goal, um, then it becomes really easy to become bipartisan. Uh, obviously, there are going to be areas that you know that you're not going to agree upon. So you focus on the areas that you can agree upon. And uh, when these, we've been able to do that very well at the county level. Um, I, I can think of a number of times whenever we have a problem that seems like it's insurmountable, or that it's something that we really aren't going to get every uh, that has to be that has to get done. We've always been able, to, Chip and I and, uh, and Mike, have always been able to call on our row officers and the decision makers in the community and, at our, in, our, uh, and, and in our government uh, to get into a room. And I can't think of a single time where we haven't left with a pretty s decent solution to a problem, at least some things to try, and everyone on board with uh, pulling, the, play, pulling their weight and playing their part to do that. Um, so really it is, as long as, you, it's like with any team, you realize that you're not going to get anything done alone. Uh, and when you realize that people in good faith have the best interest of the community at heart, it makes it pretty easy to get that stuff done. It's not like Washington, D.C., where I experienced that pretty well and still actually did a pretty good job down there of getting a lot of bipartisan bills passed. But um, it's a heck of a lot easier here than it is there. 
So myself and our auditor, Terry McFadden, are the only two Democrats elected in the county, <coughs> in county office. So <clears throat> bipartisanship, that's what we have to do. That's a good point. The other side I will tell you is, <laughs> yeah, okay. the other side is county government is the last level of government where politics and party lines don't come into, into effect at all. That we have not made a decision in my eight years that was a party line decision. We replace general, we replace roofs, we balance budgets, we hire and fire people, and we look out for the well-being of the county. Those aren't party line decisions that we make. And that's one thing that I, I truly love about county government. Another thing on the bipartisanship, um, I did run for president of the County Commissioners Association to put Venango County on the map to get us another voice out there. And I was unanimously elected by all county commissioners, Republican and Democrat, across, across this Commonwealth. That's bipartisanship. When I'm in Harrisburg in Lee's office, or I'm in Harrisburg in the pro temp of the Senate, and the minority leader, the majority leader, R's and D's, we're there advocating on bipartisan county issues, which is 911 reauthorization funding, whether that's rural broadband, whether that's mental health increase funding. That is not a partisan decision in the county level. That's what makes this county commissioner role so unique and what I, I love about it the most. We're one of three people and the minority commis commissioner just has the same say as the majority because what we do is we care about our residents. And I got that instilled with me when I first got elected from a commissioner, a Republican commissioner, 24 year commissioner is retiring this year in Tioga County. He said to me, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here to learn and grow and expand and learn county government. He goes, just remember one thing, you are here for everyone in your county, even those that don't vote. You're not here because of a party. And I've always had that instilled with me, and I always believe every decision we make is for the betterment of all, whether you vote, don't vote, whether you just moved here and not registered to vote, but that's what county government is. We're the most robust, boots on the ground, here for everybody position. Thank you very much. And to wrap it up, the annual, did you start? <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I personally appreciate this opportunity and have learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else can agree. Uh, I've heard a lot of uh, overlap. I've also heard some differences. And so we wanted to give uh, one final chance uh, for each of you to uh, essentially state your case and uh, let all of us know in a two-minute closing statement uh, if you could summarize your key points and just please reiterate uh, your strengths and uh, what makes you a unique and qualified candidate for this upcoming role. So with this time, uh, Mr. Beef, mm -hmm. you're on deck. Great. Hey, that, you, you just wait and see how good that is. Hold on a second. Uh, so I'm a huge, yeah, yeah, Michelle knows. I'm a huge fan of movies. I, I love them. Anytime I'm folding laundry, there's one on in the background, and we have two adults and three kids in our house, so I'm constantly folding laundry. All right. One of my favorite movies is actually Moneyball. Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill, great movie. It's actually based on a true story, too. Uh, it's about Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland A's, and their historic run to win the AL West in 2002. At one point, they actually won 22 games in a row. Uh, and they did that with a $44 million a year budget. To put that into perspective, the New York Yankees spent $125 million that year. But really, what that movie is about is being unafraid to reevaluate what it takes to win baseball games, being unafraid to go against convention, being unafraid to ask the difficult questions in the hopes of creating something better. It's about being unafraid to challenge the status quo, to stand up and ask if there's a better way to do something. And this bravery led to something incredible. I'm tired of the status quo. I'm ready to start asking the difficult questions. It's time we take the focus away from politics and start focusing on public service. I've got the public service experience. I've got the diverse work and life experience necessary to bring a new perspective. I've got the desire, the motivation, and the relationships necessary to see the vision through to the end. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on the cusp of something great in Venango County. 
All we have to do is think about things a little differently, bring a new perspective to the table. We need leaders who aren't afraid to ask the difficult questions and to challenge the status quo. If we do that, then there's nothing we can't accomplish. I'm excited to be your next commissioner. On November 7th, vote for me, Matt Beef. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I swear, that, that was right. not planned at all. Play like a champion. All right. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for being here. The honor of my life has been serving as county commissioner of Venango County, but my entire adult life has been about public service. Uh, when, I, when I first got the opportunity to work for Congressman Mike Kelly and he asked me to come down to Washington, it wasn't because I had legislative experience. It's because he knew that I knew and loved this region of the country more than anybody that he could find. And I went down there and I went down there with a chip on my shoulder to make sure that our area was represented. Uh, at I was almost going to say violently, but very strongly <laughs> represented uh, on his staff and in, in Congress. I've always been motivated by uh, the story that I tell from that I've told forever. That um, it's my origin story, I guess, if, for why I got into politics. And I remember uh, very well fourth grade Quaker State closing and. Uh, a quarter of my class no longer being there the next year. And it drove me crazy that there wasn't someone, why can't someone stop this? How do we stop this? What can I do when I grow up to make this place uh, as vibrant as it can be? And, um, and so I thought this is a route to do that. Uh, through my experience, I've uh, gained a lot of connections, frankly. Uh, I feel like I bring a lot to the table, and I wouldn't run if I didn't think that I was the best person for the job. That's pretty big to say, I know. It can sound like it's uh, not a humble thing to say because there are some phenomenal candidates running for county commissioner this time around. But I think I can work very well and compliment any one of them that's in there, and uh, that's why I humbly ask for another opportunity to serve as your county commissioner and I ask for your vote on November 7th or by mail-in if uh, that's how you choose to do it. Thank you very much. So thank you all for being here. Thank you guys for hosting this. Thank you to the chamber. Uh, thank you for electing me for two terms and a potential third term. I truly love what I do. And I always got to use this quote. It's like riding a bull. Once you nod your head, you're all in. And I have been all in for eight years and plan to be all in for another four years. I go above and beyond. It's 24-7, seven days a week for me. This is a weird passion, and I kind of get nerded out on county government, like I said before. But I love this. I love trying to create opportunities. I love helping people in the community with an opportunity that they didn't know they had. I love the networking side of it. I love our municipalities. Just the other day, I gave one of them a check for $50,000 for a project out of our Marcellus money. And, and to see how county government can help, and to see how county government can build connections. I always say, your first term, you learn. You understand. You don't understand. It's a fire hose for four years. Our second term, we've lost to two years with COVID. But that's where you can start to see implementation. The third term, I'm really excited because that implementation, and especially this year being the president and the connections I made, can capitalize on. There's so many great opportunities that we have in front of us, and it's, it's putting it together, and it's packaging it and making it happen. Because there's a lot to learn in county government, and it takes time. And I'll call out Kevin Boozle, commissioner from Butler County that's here tonight. He knows as well. We both got elected at the same time, but it, it's that. It's collaborating together as counties, just like we talk about our municipalities collaborating together at our COG meetings. It's, it's an opportunity for us to grow and expand together. And I always say we're turning the Rust Belt to the Smart Belt, but we truly are. And we've truly done great things over the past eight years. I've been in office and Bonnie and Vince before me, but we're there. It's just moving that ahead. And, and I truly believe one more term, all of that can be packaged and all of those connections can be built on. So I appreciate every, each and every one of you for giving me this opportunity. It's been a blessing. And please remember, vote Abramovic November 7th. Thank you all for being here and appreciate your time. Wait a minute, all three of them have asked for the vote. How many positions are there? <laughs> Get ready for that same statement at the end. Um, this was a tough decision for me uh, because, you know, it's a completely different leap than anything I've ever been involved with. I mean, 
I'm blessed. I mean, I've always been in, in a leadership role, uh, sometimes by choice, sometimes by default. I mean, in high school, I was captain of the football team or co-captain. I don't want to slight Mike Laporte. Um, <laughs> captain of the wrestling team. I was a platoon leader in the military. I've been on several lead teams throughout my career. Uh, when I got involved in the entertainment business, somehow, some way, I was able to work my way from a regional person all the way up to a senior vice president. And it's not by being the smartest guy in the room. It's sure as heck not by being the greatest athlete. Um, but it's because I prey on a lot of my decisions and I try to help, you know, help God help me in the process and the things that I do. And I've had the ability to surround myself with good people. And looking around this room and looking at in our chambers and Lee and the leadership we have here and um, that's who, when you, if you elect me for county commissioner, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see a person that is going to have open, be open-minded, going to be always looking for outside sources, and is not afraid to make tough decisions. Uh, that's why I would love to have your vote on November 7th. Thank you. I think I'm going to vote for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Sam. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Good job. Thank okay. you very well, much. Very good job, both of you. Yeah. It's hard not to be hopeful when we hear the things we heard tonight. Sam. So, uh, hey, like can the job, you, brother. Thank, thank you. You too. Dan for facilitating, and I thank the four of you for answering our questions. Um, I would ask that you all hold me accountable. No <laughs> we would like to uh, convene again in six to nine months uh, when we know who are serving as commissioners, and, and that's where we can do the, the drill now. That's <laughs> who is doing what they said they're going to do. Um, I can tell you that all of these gentlemen have made themselves very accessible to the chamber as we do to them. So um, I would ask that you continue to have that open door, that you give us the opportunity to, to work with you. I think the relationship of the business community to the county is, is so important to our success. Um, I plan to, to be here for the rest of my life, and uh, so I count on you guys to make sure that it's a great place for, for not only me, but for my, my children and for my new grandson to come back. So, um, I thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, we did attempt to stream. I'm not sure how we did on that because um, broadband. Um, but we <laughs> 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 were successful recording. So if you know someone that missed tonight, we will do our best to get that posted. Uh, probably on the Chamber's YouTube channel and uh, Facebook. We'll, we'll do our best. We'll get it up there somewhere. If cool. we have to, we'll put it on the little stick and give you. <laughs> so uh, thank you again. Um, I think as, as long as we don't get kicked out of the facility, linger a bit. Um, thank these gentlemen. Uh, get a chance to know each other better, and don't forget to vote on the 7th. Um, get out there and make it important. Thank you. Good job, thank guys. You guys. Good job. Good job, Ben. I want to do more of these. I do, too.